In September of 2023, two of the largest companies in Las Vegas suffered a major cybersecurity breach. Let's break down what happened and what steps you can take so that it doesn't happen to you or your organization. Hi, my name is Rich and welcome to the Rich Tech Guy channel. And uh, in this video, let's take a look at the recent cybersecurity incident that happened in Las Vegas uh, in regards to these two large hotel and casino companies. And let's utilize this as a case study, analyze it, and see what you can do to help improve the cybersecurity in your organization. But first, if you like this content, go ahead and hit that like button. And uh, if you're not subscribed to this channel, go ahead and subscribe to this channel as well. And now let's get into a summary of what happened. On September 10th of 2023, MGM Resorts reported that they were experiencing some challenges with their systems as a result of a cybersecurity issue. And we're working through it to, in order to restore those systems. Over the next week, all of MGM systems were crippled in a cyber attack, resulting in, in chaos and confusion for employees and guests alike at MGM Resorts. As the situation unfolded and information was released by either MGM or the ransomware group ALF-V, we learned the following information. According to the account uh, at VX Underground on X, formerly Twitter, the attackers gained initial access by browsing LinkedIn. And once they found an employee who would have had the access they needed, they called MGM's help desk, presumably to request a password reset and through social engineering techniques, have that reset, uh, that password reset rerouted to them instead of to the employee they were impersonating. Then, based off of the statement released by the ransomware group, uh, once they were in, they gained access to MGM's Okta identity management servers and began sniffing passwords for MGM users. At this point, MGM's ability to defend was basically over. Uh, once attackers get control of an identity management system, they can become anyone in the company or they can even manufacture their own identities as if they are themselves part of the company. Uh, so the attackers further stated that once MGM realized the systems were compromised, they cut off all access to the identity management system. This effectively resulted in MGM going scorched earth on themselves uh, because by cutting off the identity management systems, uh, they prevented authentication and authorization for their users. So if an internal user tried to utilize an application within the company, let's say to check in a guest, uh, without the identity management systems or without access to that, the request would have been denied and they would not have had the ability to carry out their normal job functions. Okay, so according to the statement that was put out by the attackers, in response to MGM's attempt to block them, keep in mind at this point, they would have had access to anything in MGM's systems. So in response to what MGM was doing, uh, they deployed ransomware to MGM's VMware ESXi servers. And that would have brought down every virtual machine that was on those servers. And if MGM wasn't already down at this point, that would have just taken them completely down. Recovering from this kind of an attack took weeks, if not months. Uh, while MGM did restore uh, business activity and uh, was able to work with getting guests checked into rooms and, and uh, provide services to facil facilitate guest needs, uh, within a week, the, result, uh, the resulting activity internally uh, to 
bring everything back to normal would, would have been far, far greater. While all of the news was breaking around MGM resorts, there was another cybersecurity attack going on in Las Vegas, which we also later learned was from the same attacker group. This attack was focused on Caesars Entertainment. However, we do not have as much information on that, and the reason is because there wasn't very much attention paid to Caesars as opposed to MGM. And I'll go into why in a little bit. What we do know about Caesars is from their own 8K filings that they put with the SEC. And in those 8K filings, they indicated that they had a third-party company managing some or all of its IT infrastructure. And that third-party company was breached through a social engineering attack. Now, once that company was attacked, they had access to Caesar's infrastructure and effectively the same thing that happened to MGM could have played out. However, the reason why we don't have as much information about Caesar's and why there wasn't so much attention paid to Caesar's was because Caesar's took a different approach to the attack. While MGM responded by attempting to fight the attackers, Caesar's, on the other hand, decided to maintain business continuity and pay the ransom. Now, I don't have exact numbers as to how much the ransom was, but what I do know, uh, just from comments that had been posted out there, was the ransom was in the tens of millions of dollars, but Caesars had negotiated it down to approximately half of the original demand. Now, does this mean that if your organization is under a cybersecurity attack, you should just pay the ransom? Absolutely not. That is not what I, the message I am trying to convey. What I do want to convey is that every organization needs to have a cybersecurity incident response playbook to address these types of situations. In fact, according to recent statistics, 60% of organizations do not have a cybersecurity incident response playbook. Also noteworthy is about 60% of businesses end up closing their doors and shutting down completely within six months of a major cybersecurity breach. This is because they are unable to handle the financial burden of uh, responding to the attack, working through the attack, recovering from the attack, dealing with the fallout, which can include the fallout of reputation of the business, how that business is managing their company's data, and that could result in loss of business. So what can we learn from this? Uh, we know from the information that we have that uh, both of these attacks happened as a result of a social engineering attack. In fact, according to a recent cybersecurity uh, statistic, 90% of cybersecurity breaches are through social engineering attacks. I'm bringing this up first and foremost, and before I talk about any technology or product or solution, uh, because you can have all the best technology out there in the world, and it's absolutely meaningless if somebody inside your organization opens the door for the attackers. Okay. This is why it is important to uh, train everybody in your organization on how to identify and respond to a social engineering attack. Okay. Um, one of the most common ways a social engineering attack happens is through email. Okay, in this particular instance, we do not know, and in fact, it likely indicates that, that uh, they did not use email per se, but uh, let's, let's take a little bit of a speculative uh, take on this and uh, just go through a thought experiment, okay? We know the attackers browsed LinkedIn and found an employee that they wanted to impersonate in order to uh, gain access into the system. What we don't know is if the attackers had targeted that employee in, a in what is called a spear phishing attack prior to contacting the help desk. Now, the only people who would know if the employee was compromised prior to that is likely going to be the attackers themselves. But Essentially, a spear phishing attack is, uh, is more, much more focused than a normal phishing attack. 
uh, a normal phishing email is going to be fairly broad, sent out to lots of people in the hopes that uh, you get a few people to click on it and uh, uh, somebody uh, then downloads malicious data onto their system. A spear phishing attack is specifically targeted at a single individual or a few individuals that an attacker knows will, they will get better results if that particular individual is compromised. So, as always, when, talk, when working with an email uh, or with any sort of a phishing, spear phishing email, first of all, if you receive anything suspicious, do not click on any of the links. Do not open any of the attachments. Then, if, it is some, if you are working for an organization, report that email to your company's IT. If this is, say, a personal email, if that uh, email is pretending to be from a company, a lot of businesses out there have a means for you to report that, e that phishing email of attackers pretending to be that company. So if you're able to report it, report the email. Then, if, uh, whether or not you're able to report it, uh, what you need to do is flag that email for your own spam filter to prevent future emails from coming through from this particular attacker. And lastly, delete the email, get rid of it, okay? You don't want it on your system, you don't want to somehow inadvertently later click on it or whatever, just delete the email. All right, let's look past the uh, possibility of the employee being compromised by a phishing email. Uh, let's instead now take a look at the actual help desk call that was reported regarding the attack. So this is where, as an organization, there needs to be policies in place for handling uh, such things as password resets, and those policies must be uh, followed fairly strictly and make sure those policies actually do work before uh, truly enforcing them. But if this was a case where the employee was uh, compromised beforehand, the help desk call may have actually seemed like a normal help desk call where the attackers were calling in pretending to be the employee, they were going through the, the motions, going through the policies, but those attackers had injected themselves into the process to where they were able to redirect and recover the password reset for themselves. So that is one possibility. But let's take a speculative path in a different direction. And let's look at the possibility that maybe those uh, attackers had not compromised the employee beforehand. And so now when they're making that help desk call to impersonate the employee, uh, they have to pull off a bit of a con game to try to convince the help desk staff to uh, go outside any established policies and send a password reset request to an area it would not normally go. Okay, so if we go down this particular speculation and down that path, I actually find it a little bit ironic from having been in Las Vegas many, many times, and I can tell you that the, the city has uh, a lot of con artists who are trying to talk uh, their way into getting money from casinos, the casino staff, the hotel staff, or tourists, or really anybody who will talk to them. So uh, from that perspective, I do find it somewhat ironic that if that was what had actually happened. But uh, the thing that we really do need to focus on and the points we need to come back to and address are that companies need to have organization, uh, organizational policies around handling sensitive information like login credentials, password resets. Also, there needs to be some policies around or training around uh, identifying a social engineering attack and how to respond to it. And also, organizations need to have an established and maintained cybersecurity incident response playbook. I'm gonna get to this again too. So what kind of technology or solutions can we deploy to uh, try to mitigate or stop this kind of an attack? So when analyzing what happened, the very first thing that came to mind was multi-factor authentication. 
Okay. There's a variety of multi-factor authentication uh, solutions out there, uh, one of which would be, say, Cisco Duo. Now, the way the multi-authentication, multi-factor authentication works, you know, say that three times fast in like a tongue twister type thing, but the way multi-factor authentication works is that when you log into a system, you are then prompted through another means of communication. This could be an email sent uh, to you with a particular code that you then have to input at a prompt at the original website. That could also happen through a text message, uh, or you could have to log into an authenticator app, which will continuously generate a random code and you have to enter in that code before it expires. Or that could be handled in the background and you just acknowledge on the app, yes, this is me, uh, that I, I am legitimately trying to log into this, okay? So this right here, it will not stop a determined attack. However, the majority of attackers out there, when they run into this, they're just going to try to move on and find an easier target. Uh, now, a determined attacker will find a way around this, possibly through, say, compromising an individual and getting access to the device or the email account that the multi-factor authentication would happen. So that means that we need to have a multi-layered security approach. So the next thing that comes to mind in regards to preventing or mitigating such an attack is hitting the like button and also the subscribe button if you're not already subscribed. That won't actually stop an attack, but it will help me to grow this channel. In all seriousness, back to the topic at hand. So the next solution really that comes to mind is a zero trust network infrastructure. Now, zero trust has is uh, this big security buzzword that's been thrown around and, and all the security companies out there are saying, oh, we've got this zero trust product, this zero trust solution. But that's not really the way to look at a zero trust infrastructure, okay? Zero trust infrastructure really needs to be looked at as a strategy for architecting and deploying your infrastructure. Now, both NIST and CISA have published frameworks on architecting zero trust, and I will link to them in the description below. Also, all of the big cybersecurity companies like, say, Cisco, have their own guidelines and architecture uh, designs for implementing zero trust. But really, it all comes down to uh, five pillars, okay? So you have the identity of the users, you have devices, you have the network, you have the applications and workloads, and then lastly, you have the data. A zero trust infrastructure is looking at all of these. So how does this apply to the situation at hand? Okay, so in this particular example, we have a company based in Las Vegas we have a user who presumably is also based in Las Vegas, all right? Now, if the user uh, is using a company device inside of the uh, organization and logs in using that company-owned device, conducts the activity that is consistent with their job, a zero-trust infrastructure will let all of that go through, it's not gonna have any problem, okay? Now, let's add a little bit of a mix. Let's say it is the legitimate user, but this time that user logs in, say, at home on a personal device, or maybe is out on vacation and wants to uh, check back in because, uh, you know, here in the United States, nobody really goes on vacation. We just sort of do our work somewhere else. But, the, they're logging in from a personal device outside of company infrastructure, okay? So now, Zero Trust is likely going to set up some additional flags uh, that require some additional verification steps um, and may even require that the user creates a profile for that particular device that they are going to use to connect. For example, I recently got a new phone and uh, with this phone here, 
what, uh, when I went to go access the, my company's email, okay, I had to go through a process of setting, of creating a profile for it. I had to download a security app onto the phone uh, that uh, will report to the company that yes, this is the, the correct device. Uh, had to make some configuration changes on it to meet IT security. And uh, finally, I had a profile and all the, the steps were in place to where the uh, security infrastructure at my company would say, okay, me using this phone, I can access my company IT uh, or my, my company email. Uh, so IT permitted that to happen. All right. Now, let's take a look at it from the standpoint of a malicious actor. So now the user has been compromised, the credentials are compromised, and a malicious actor is trying to get in. So let's take a look at it for maybe the user is, uh, ha ha was on their device, they logged out, they went home, that user is based in Las Vegas, and now, 30 minutes later, a malicious actor who has the credentials for that user is going to try to log in from, say, Europe, Asia, somewhere else in the world, okay? Using some behavioral analytics, a zero-trust infrastructure is going to know that there is no possible way that this user could have gone from the office or their home in Las Vegas to another continent in 30 minutes. All right, uh, the, the transporter from Star Trek has not yet been invented. So it's going to immediately flag that and say, hey, there's a problem. Or maybe there's even the possibility that the user is actively logged into the system when the malicious actor tries to connect from another part of the world. Again, it's going to get flagged. And then on top of that, the zero trust infrastructure, uh, you know, maybe somehow the malicious actor gets through, but the zero trust infrastructure is going to be looking at what's happening with that user activity. Is that consistent with what the user would do? Is the, this user accessing the, uh, the systems that that user would access? Now, granted that from what we understand based off of the details we have of this particular incident, the user that was compromised was working in the company's IT department. So it is likely that that user would have accessed the identity management server. But again, would that user have spontaneously created some new user, logged out, and then the new user would have logged in? That would be open to further speculation, okay? So, uh, or would that user, would? start taking massive amounts of data at that company, data relating to uh, customers, uh, personally identifiable information regarding those customers, and start copying that data off of the systems to some external source. That's not something that that kind of a user would be doing. So this is something that the zero trust infrastructure would actually flag and say, wait a minute, this is not consistent with what should be happening. and would possibly deny it, run it through additional verification steps, and essentially make sure that, yes, this actually is a legitimate business activity, okay? And if it cannot verify that, then it would block the activity. Now, even after all of this gets deployed into an infrastructure, and we've got all the security systems in place, and we've got all our people trained up, the Next thing that we need is absolutely critical, and that is a cybersecurity incident response playbook. Okay, the cybersecurity incident response playbook will help determine what actions are need to be taken in a variety of uh, cybersecurity incidents or attacks or breaches. Based off of what what happened in Las Vegas during this attack. Personally, and just through my thought, my, my view alone from what I saw happen, is that I would guess that MGM actually did have a cybersecurity incident response playbook, and they started working on it as soon as they realized they were compromised. However, it did not work for them. 
So there, that means that it's not only essential to have the incident response playbook, but it is also essential to maintain and update it regularly. So how do we go about doing this? Well, one of the best ways to do this is through something called a, a, a incident response simulation, also referred to as a tabletop exercise. Okay, so what happens in one of these types of events is the technical teams and the company leadership come together and they play through a simulation of a cybersecurity attack. And uh, depending on who's coordinating this, there could be any number of scenarios utilized, but the teams and the management have to respond based off of what is in their cybersecurity playbook. So they'll go through the simulation, work through what the, the playbook says they need to do, and then at the end, there needs to be a debrief session. The debrief session needs to address uh, what was done well, what areas uh, were missing, where did were mistakes made, where were unnecessary actions taken. And after going through all of that in the debrief and analyzing all of that, the cybersecurity incident response playbook needs to be updated. And uh, in doing so, you are maintaining your playbook. So what happened in Las Vegas in September of 2023 regarding these two hotel and casino companies should be utilized as a case study and analyzed by every organization out there in order to improve their security posture, their security profile, and their security policies. What are your thoughts on the matter? Go ahead and leave a comment down below. And uh, also, in addition to the links that I've mentioned in the video, I'm also going to leave some additional links for study material regarding the topics and solutions that I've discussed. Those will be affiliate links, so take that information as you will. Uh, and with that, I am just going to say uh, keep learning, keep studying, keep improving, keep yourself secure, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.